So good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Taylor, the director of the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth College. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the eighth annual Dr. Alan W. Root Contemporary Art Distinguished Lecture at the Hood Museum of Art. I would like to thank Alan and Janet Root, who are in the audience with us today, and to also recognize their granddaughter, Gillian, who is a member of the class of 2014 at Dartmouth. Dr. Root graduated from Dartmouth in 1955, as did his son Jonathan in 1982 and his daughter Jennifer in 1985. This family bleeds green, and we love that. Because of their father's passionate interest in contemporary art, Jonathan, Jonathan Jennifer, and their other son Michael Root established this lectureship in honor of their father, a renowned pediatric endo, endocrino, hmm, I'll start that again, endocrinologist and also a collector of modern and contemporary art. It is a great privilege for me to introduce this evening's speaker, who is Dr. Richard Meyer. Richard Meyer is one of the foremost art historians in the field of 20th century American art and visual culture. He is the professor of art history at Stanford University and has also taught at the University of Southern California, the Courtauld Institute in London, my alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania and Columbia University. At USC, he was also, from 2008 to 2011, the Director of Visual Graduate Studies and was an affiliated faculty member in American Studies and Ethnicity. He received his BA from Yale University and his PhD in Art History from the University of California, Berkeley. And his doctoral dissertation led to the landmark publication, Outlaw Representation, Censorship and Homosexuality in 20th Century American Art, which was published to great critical acclaim by Oxford University Press in 2002. He's also the author of Naked Hollywood, Ouija in Los Angeles in, in 2011, and has two publication projects forthcoming in 2013. The first for which he is co-author with Catherine Lord is titled Art and, and Queer Culture and will be published by Fiden Press. The second, which relates to the topic of this evening's lecture, is titled What Was Contemporary Art and will be published by and MIT Press, so both in 2013. Richard was also the co-editor of Ouija and Naked City in 2008, and in 2003 he edited the volume Representing the Passions, Histories, Bodies, and Visions for the Getty Research Institute. In 2006, Richard was co-editor of a two-part issue of the, of the journal GLQ, a journal of lesbian and gay studies. He has served as curators of exhibitions as well, including Naked Hollywood, Ouija in Los Angeles at the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles in 2011, and Warhol's Jews, 10 Portraits Reconsidered at the Jewish Museum in New York in 2008. I saw both of those exhibitions and they were absolutely outstanding. He is the author of numerous journal articles and edited volumes with such thought-provoking titles as Big Middle Class Modernism, Artists Sometimes Have Feelings, <laughs> Gay Power, Circa 1970, Visual Strategies for Sexual Revolution, Mind the Gap, Americanist, Modernist, and the Boundaries of 20th Century Art, The Jesse Helms Theory of Art, <laughs> Have You Heard the One About the Lesbian Who Goes to the Supreme Court, This Is to Enrage You, Grand Fury and the Graphics of AIDS Activism, Robert Maplethorpe and the Discipline of Photography, and Los Angeles Meant Boys, David Hockney, Bob Miser, and The Lure of Physique Photography, to name but a few. Those were just my favorite titles. <laughs> Richard has been the recipient of numerous awards, including the Charles C. Eldridge Prize for Outstanding Scholarship in American Art, which is awarded by the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Mellon Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Men Mentoring, and the Albert S. Raubenheimer Award for Outstanding Teaching, Research, and Service to the University of Southern California. His talk this evening is entitled, What Was Contemporary Art? An Introduction. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Meyer. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I, um, I first met Michael Taylor six years ago in Philadelphia when he was a curator at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and I was a visiting professor of contemporary art history at the University of Pennsylvania. And I was immediately struck by his generosity of spirit and of intellect, 
and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to reunite with him and to meet all of you here at the Hood Museum at Dartmouth. And this is my first um, time visiting not only Dartmouth, but New Hampshire, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, the book project I was working on at the time I met Michael, the one I finally finished, and I'm going to preview for you here today. That book project addresses the tension between contemporary art and art history. How, it asks, can contemporary works be part of the history of art when those works have not been time-tested or vetted? when the necessary critical and historical distance has not yet been achieved. How, indeed, can there even be something called contemporary art history? And I'll remind you that I was visiting professor of contemporary art history uh, at Penn, but I was, even as I accepted the position, I was sort of wondering, well, what is this strange beast? Um, and that's where the book uh, comes in. So I'm showing you. This is the cover of the book. Um, it features a young woman, one Miss Polly Cotter, facing off against a plexiglass sculpture by Alexander Calder at the Plastics Exhibition held at the Institute of Modern Art in Boston in 1940. <laughs> the sculpture had recently won first prize in an art contest sponsored by the chemical manufacturing company Rome and Haas, the inventors and commercial distributors of plexiglass. Created by the company as a shatterproof alternative to glass in 1933, plexiglass was introduced to American markets within the context of military production. So it was first used for cockpit covers, windscreens, and weapon mounts. The sculptural competition in 1939 underscored the possibility of an aesthetic rather than strictly utilitarian or militaristic application of the material. As the winning entry, in, um, in the competition, and here, here's the sculpture from a different angle. Uh, it's the same sculpture you're seeing here. As the winning entry, Scalder's, <laughs> Calder's sculpture was given pride of place in the Roman Haas Pavilion at the 1939 New York World's Fair. That's what I'm showing you um, on the screen on the right. Displayed on a circular table to allow viewers to approach from all sides, the sculpture was set against a series of seven backlit dioramas, each of which demonstrated a different property, flexibility, lightness, luminosity, of plexiglass or its sister plastic, crystallite. Um, and there you see the pavilion, which features um, plexiglass, the, 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 the uh, showcases plexiglass, crystallite, and um, Calder's sculpture. In their very datedness, the picture of Polly Cotter from 1940 and the Roman Haas Pavilion from the World's Fair in 1939, in their very datedness, these pictures recall that the category of contemporary art is not a new one. All works of art were once contemporary to the artist and culture that produced them. Part of the task of the art historian, then, is to retrieve a vivid sense of the world into which an artwork was introduced, and so to measure the distance between its contemporary moment and the scholar's own. Between, say, um, 1939, when plexiglass had only recently been introduced and was still kind of a marvel of a material, and today. Um, our return to the past must acknowledge the impossibility of forging a comprehensive account of the artwork as it really was, while nevertheless attending to the specificity and heft of history. By asking what was contemporary art, I do not mean to suggest that contemporary art is now over, or that we have arrived at a post-contemporary moment of cultural production, which some have suggested. Rather, I mean to retrieve selected episodes in the history of once current art, so as to reclaim the contemporary as a condition of being alive to and alongside other moments, artists, and objects. So something like what we now call contemporaneous, that is, existing along with or alongside, alive at the same moment as. 
Today, I want to share with you an excerpt from the book's introduction and a brief sketch of its principal chapters. And I'm giving fair warning that we'll be jumping around quite a bit between different art historical examples and contexts. Um, one of those contexts, which I've just briefly introduced to you, is the plastics exhibition at the Institute of Modern Art in 1940. Um, the Institute of Modern Art, which to great controversy, would rename itself the Institute of Contemporary Art in 1948. And there's a chapter of the book that looks at that controversy. And through that controversy, looks back at the history of the Institute of Contemporary slash Modern Art. Um, in the book's introduction, which I'm going to turn to now, I seek to explain how and when contemporary art emerged as part of the discipline of art history. And in doing so, I revisit the doctoral thesis of a now eminent art historian. The introduction is called The Art Historical Postmortem. In ninth, so here's, this is an excerpt from the introduction. In 1969, a young woman named Rosalind Krauss filed a dissertation in the Department of Fine Arts at Harvard University. Fifteen years later, after she had emerged as one of the leading critical and art historical thinkers of her generation, Krauss would explain the unorthodox means by which she had chosen her dissertation topic. And here is a quote, long quote from Rosalind Krauss. I was in fact thinking of a topic in 19th century European art that would have been much more palatable to my professors at Harvard. But it was going to be difficult for me to go to France for a year in the middle of this marriage. She had recently wed uh, Richard Krauss. I didn't know what to do until one morning I woke up to an announcement on my clock radio that a sculptor had been killed in Vermont. I thought it was Tony Caro because they said Bennington, Vermont, where he was teaching. I thought, oh, how terrible, because I knew Tony. Then, after a couple of sentences, they repeated the name, and I realized it was David Smith. I thought, um, I now have a thesis topic. I knew they would never allow me to do a dissertation on someone who was alive, but he had just died. I went rushing to Harvard to announce this as my topic." End quote. Within the logic of this anecdote, the shift from the imagined death of Anthony Caro to the actual one of David Smith constitutes a passage from personal loss to professional opportunity, from the register of friendship to that of scholarship, from the terrible thought that a sculptor Krauss knew firsthand had perished to the recognition of the use value of an entirely different sculptor's demise. Death here delivers the artist into history, or at least into the history of art. Sealed off from the possibility of new works, stylistic shifts, imaginative breakthroughs, or creative disappointments, Smith's artistic output could at last be scrutinized, interpreted, and cataloged by the art historian. Krauss, in other words, could now write a thesis on David Smith, but only and almost literally over his dead body. Even here, however, there was a catch. To make Smith more palatable as a, subject, as a topic, Krauss's advisors approved her um, dissertation on the condition that she prepare a catalog resume of Smith's sculpture as part of this thesis. Krauss dutifully researched and photographed some 700 sculptures. So a catalog resume, as many of you will know, is a catalog that includes all the works, in this case all the sculptures, by uh, a single um, artist. Um, Krauss dutifully researched and photographed some 700 sculptures dating from 1932, the year that Smith turned from painting to three-dimensional construction, or what he called drawing in space, to 1965, the year in which he was killed in an automobile accident. He missed a turn in the road and was crushed inside his pickup truck. And a, a range of sculptural production I've represented here by showing you construction from 1932 on the left, which is number four in Krauss's catalog resume, and um, QB 28 from 1965, um, which is number 676 uh, in Krauss's um, catalog. And it is the last work that David Smith completed before his death in 1965. The glossy color image of um, QB 28, shown here, is not from Krauss's dissertation. 
There's the image from Krauss's dissertation. In, it, it's the same work, but a, um, a very different uh, view. Oops, different view, as you can see. Um, the, uh, in which the images, as you might expect, are, are black and white photographs circa 1969. But the image on the left is from the catalog of Sotheby's sale of contemporary art held in New York City on the evening of Wednesday, November 9th, 2005. QB 28, also known that evening as Lot 23, sold for $23.8 million to the dealer Larry Gagosian, who was himself bidding on behalf of the collector Eli Brode. The sale of QB 28 um, set a new record for the price of a single work of contemporary art at auction, a record that had, in fact, been broken just the night before when Christie's sold Mark Rothko's homage, homage to Matisse uh, for $22.4 million. So Homage to Matisse only held the record for less than a day because the ne very next day, um, Smith's QB28 um, broke the record. And of course, that's a record that has now been broken many times since. Though Rothko had been dead for 35 years and Smith for 40, by the time these records were set, the prices paid for each man's work in 2005 raised the bar for the secondary market in post-war painting and sculpture. Here then, we have a conception of contemporary art attuned to the logic and temporalities of the auction market rather than to those of the artist's life and death. So one question we might ask is, what makes um, David Smith's work or Mark Rothko's work contemporary still um, in 2005? And, and I'm suggesting that one of the ways in which it's contemporary is that um, it's, it's breaking a, a record for post-war art, and it doesn't matter any longer that the artist is deceased because the work is living on in the marketplace and in the culture. Um, and so the market renews the contemporaneity, the relevance of the work by, um, by having it be a record breaker at a particular auction. The rationale behind the intense bidding over the Smith sculpture, according to the New York Times, was plain to lovers of, con quote, was plain to lovers of contemporary art. This elegantly composed melding of boxes and columns may be the last example of the series to come on the market for some time. Most of the others are in museums or collections where they will stay for generations. So this last chance opportunity was irresistible, which is why the sculpture's final price was nearly double its high estimate of $12 million, end quote. The last sculpture completed by Smith before his accidental death in 1965 thus becomes 40 years later the last of its highly prized series available for private purchase. Returning to Krauss's dissertation complicates the narrative of QB28's irresistible lastness in significant ways. For as it turns out, Smith's physical death did not mark the, the end point of his artistic production. Krauss's catalog includes eight sculptures that were begun by Smith but completed posthumously by Leon Pratt, the artist's close associate and welder during the seven years before Smith's death. Krauss steps outside. When, when the catalog reaches these works, Krauss steps outside her own sequential system by designating them not with consecutive numbers, but with letters, posthumous A through H. So I'm showing you from 1966 when they were completed the year after Smith's death. I'm showing you posthumous E, F, G, and H from Krauss's dissertation. I just have, ooh, <laughs> I just have to get my water, sorry. Speaking of the needs of the living. Um, return, um, given the exhaustive scope of Krauss's catalog resume, which traces Smith's sculpture, can you hear me okay? which traces Smith's sculptural production throughout and even beyond his lifetime. The logic that guides the rest of her dissertation is brilliantly paradoxical. In the long essay, so the dissertation was three chapters that formed an essay, and then the catalog resume, which included almost 700 items. But in the long essay that precedes the catalog, Krauss argues that art historical chronology and biographical sequence are precisely the wrong tools for understanding Smith's preeminence as a modernist sculptor. 
as though in response or in revenge uh, to the very advisors who required her to locate, photograph, and date some 700 sculptures, as well as dig up every public statement, lecture, and radio interview by this famously loquacious artist, Krauss positioned her interpretation of Smith's modernism against, quote, against the testimony which, with, which a brute chronological succession of works provides, and against, quote, any simple idea of symbiosis between David Smith and his historical context. And the first chapter of the dissertation is called David Smith's Career Beyond a Historical Context. In thinking about Krauss's dismissal of context and of history, it helps to know that she was working as an art critic at the time she was preparing her dissertation. She was writing especially for Art Forum magazine and also for Art International and other periodicals. She was reviewing exhibitions in New York and Boston, and she was developing a more public writerly voice. Her mentor in this field, the preeminent uh, modernist critic Clement Greenberg, um, uh, um, inculcated in Krauss the lesson that, quote, the first obligation of an art critic is to deliver value judgments, end quote. Um, so Krauss, um, in the essay, is delivering value judgments about which of the works of, in, of the 700 really matter and which do not. Uh, and her confidence in doing so, her ability to say this one matters um, and these don't, uh, comes, I'm arguing, from her um, from her work as a contemporary art critic rather than as a historian. In describing the parameters of her study, Krauss notes, quote, while the catalog of Smith's sculpture which follows this essay contains nearly 700 works, I have dealt explicitly with only about 40. This is because I believe that the quality of Smith's work derives from a particular attitude he had toward sculpture, an attitude which is fully embodied in the masterpieces of his career. End quote. Note the self-assurance of Krauss's critical voice in this passage, the certainty with which she adjudicates and separates the 40 masterpieces of Smith's sculptural output from the remainder of his career. And by the way, QB28 would be one of those masterpieces for Krauss. Construction and, uh, is not, and none of the posthumous works are, are among the 40. For Krauss, Smith's best sculptures exemplify how certain, quote, certain objects or occurrences detach themselves from their historical background and strike the scholar with their overwhelming importance. So it's literally as though the object, in its importance as an object, as a perceptual and visual experience of the viewer, in this case the scholar, the object detaches itself from history. It, 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 it breaks off from its historical surround and becomes this instantaneous and almost overwhelming visual and, and phenomenological experience that the scholar has to try to explain. With such statements, we see art history moving away from comprehensive cataloging towards critical accounts of selected artworks, away from the 700 toward ever closer readings of the 40. Um, in Krauss's writing, as in that of other leading figures in the field, the present tense encounter between object and scholar increasingly came to take precedence over the brute chronological succession of artworks and the monographic logic of biography. And one of the ways in which this was most manifest was that later Krauss's essay was published itself as a book called Terminal Ironworks, The Sculpture of David Smith. That was one book that she published, her first book. And then the catalog resume was published separately as a book called The Sculpture of David Smith, a catalog resume. So we could see art criticism um, and art history sort of breaking apart. And the catalog resume, an older version of what the task of art history would be, um, uh, published as its own um, entity, and Terminal Ironworks, an art critical um, version of art history, again, uh, standing on its own as a book from MIT Press. With Krauss's dissertation essay on David Smith, we see art history becoming criticism, and we see art history becoming contemporary. As the dissertations I now advise attest, artists no longer need to be dead or even very old to be the subject of intensive scholarly analysis. 
Today, dissertations are routinely written on artists who are in mid to late career, on recent museum exhibitions and biennials, and on current critical debates within the art world. Tenured and tenure track jobs are posted for historians of contemporary art, and endowed chairs have been established in the field. In the United States, at least, contemporary art has emerged not only as a viable field of art historical study, but as by far the most popular. An article by New York Times critic Holland Cotter reported in 2011 that, quote, an overwhelming number of applicants to art history graduate programs now declare contemporary art their field of choice. 80%, this is Holland Cotter speaking, 80% was a figure I heard repeatedly but unofficially in conversation during the annual College Art Association conference this winter. The College Art Association, which is the professional conference for artists and art historians where people go to give papers and, and uh, interview for jobs. One, uh, one source for that figure, 80%, may well have been Patricia Maynardi, a scholar of 19th century European art who convened a panel called The Crisis in Art History at the 2011 CAA conference. In her opening remarks, Minardi lamented the preponderance of art history doctoral students, eight out of every 10, specializing in contemporary art. Maybe we should drop the word history she, uh, from art history, she proposed a bit caustically to a ballroom full of art historians. Consider the following anecdote as further evidence of the rise of what I call nowism, N-O-W, slash uh, a hyphen ISM, the rise of nowism within art history. In 2009, I offered a graduate seminar at the University of Southern California that sought to historicize the idea of contemporary art. At the first meeting of the course, I was taken aback when a PhD student expressed the hope that we would not have to endure that long slog through the 90s before arriving at the current decade of art and criticism. Prior to that semester, I had rarely taught a seminar that reached the 1990s, much less slogged through them to arrive triumphantly at the millennium on the other side. The students in this class understood the designation contemporary different than, differently than I had expected. Rather than referring to art since 1945, art since 1960, or even art since 1970, contemporary meant to them the work of artists exhibiting today and in the immediate past. Banksy, Matthew Barney, Sophie Cow, Patty Chang, Sam Durant, Nikki S. Lee, Glenn Ligon, and Kathy Opie were some of the artists on whom students in the seminar had already written or, who, uh, or, on whom uh, or declared their intention of doing so in upcoming projects. In one or two cases, the students were nearly the same age as the artists they wished to study. The history they proposed to chart neatly coincided with the time of their own lives. And anyone um, uh, who, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't I, I'll just speak from experience, having taught undergraduates at USC for 15 years, um, and, and I'm about to start teaching Stanford undergraduates, I can attest to uh, the challenge of getting um, young people sometimes to think back before um, their, the time of their own lives, um, to think about uh, history as a, as a vivid and, and compelling and um, urgent matter. Again, this is a generalization, but just uh, one based on um, years in, in the classroom. Um, and also thinking about my own, um, anyway, my, my own inability as a, as a college student sometimes to think uh, before and beyond um, the experiences of my own life. Um, I think that's partially what college does, is, is forces you out of um, imagining that your own life or your own historical moment is definitive for, for everyone and everything. Um, but, uh, but as more and more historians, art historians, are writing about living artists, um, the importance of history and of the historical past and of moments before we were alive or the artists of whom we're writing were alive, the importance of history, I think, becomes um, uh, questioned. In response to this emphasis on the present, I posed to the students in the class a series of questions at once straightforward and admittedly aggressive. Why, I asked them, are you studying art history if what you really want to do is write about the contemporary moment? 
Where are the archives for your research on contemporary art? In the files of a commercial gallery? In a drawer in the artist's studio? In a theoretical paradigm? In a series of interviews that you intend to conduct with the artist? Or in the testimony of the works of art themselves? What, if anything, distinguishes your practice as a historian of contemporary art from that of an art critic? And this goes back to Krauss and her bringing of criticism into art history. And finally, how does the history of art matter to the works you plan to write about and to the scholarly contribution you hope to make? One student, and this was not the 90s slogger, but another student in the class, effectively redirected these questions to me. During her admissions interview the previous year, she recalled, faculty had emphasized the close association of the doctoral program in art history with contemporary art museums, curators, and artists, as well as its location in an international center of early 21st century art, namely Los Angeles. Since the contemporary had been used as a device to attract graduate students to the program, she reasoned, perhaps it was the professor, rather than those very students, who should define and defend the relation between contemporary art and art history. So she was basically asking, why are you putting these questions to us when we've been promised that this program um, will enjoy such close ties to the contemporary art world and to what's going on right now. So in effect, you, you're promising us that we're going to be contemporary by studying art history. Um, and in retrospect, I realized that she was right. If graduate students and emerging scholars now take contemporary art for granted as an area of specialization, it is because the discipline of art history invites them to do so. When I started graduate school in 1988, no such invitation was forthcoming. It was understood that modernists, like everyone else in the program, medievalists, classicists, early modernists, Americanists, Asianists, worked on historical artists, issues, and objects. It might have been conceivable for a modernist to study the early work of a living artist who had reached a certain golden age. In that case, however, the work at issue would have been old enough for sufficient historical distance, say about 40 years, to have been, achi to have been uh, achieved. None of these ground rules were spoken aloud, nor did they need to be. At the time, there were no professional societies for historians of contemporary art, nor were there tenure-track jobs in the field to which one might aspire. Had someone proposed the practice of something called contemporary art history, I could only have understood it as an oxymoron. Somewhere along the line, sometime perhaps in the long 1990s, things changed. The discipline of art history embraced the work of living artists. What was contemporary art, this book, is an attempt to reckon with that shift, but it is also an effort to grapple with the broader dialogue between contemporary art and the historical past. In doing so, it draws on the semantic fact that contemporary has not always signified a quality of being up to date, current, or extremely recent, the way we tend to think of contemporary now as the most recent and current of uh, art forms and that which comes after the period coming after the modern. Often contemporary art nowadays is periodized as beginning, say, in 1989 with the rise of the internet, the fall, uh, the, the end of uh, communism, um, uh, the, the, the certain kinds of interactive, I mentioned interactive technologies and the rise of globalization. Um, but I'm interested in a, a different idea of the contemporary, one, an, an older idea. The very first definition of the word in the Oxford English Dictionary, for example, uh, is as follows. Contemporary is defined as belonging to the same time, age, or period living, existing, or occurring together in time. So it is a word that conveys coexistence rather than newness. According to the entry in the OED, the variant co-temporary was in usage during the 17th and 18th centuries and became so popular as to almost expel contemporary from use. Although the preference for co-temporary faded relatively quickly, this antiquated sim synonym is a useful reminder that contemporary is at its core a relational condition. It takes two, in other words, to be contemporary. 
consider in this context the title of a book published in 1907, Randall Davies' English Society of the 18th Century in Contemporary Art, which focuses on art that portrays British society in the 1700s, not on art contemporary to Davies' own moment of writing, which was 1907, or on works that conveyed any particularly modern quality or spirit of innovation. Society for Davies meant the elite, so capital S society, of British aristocracy, as represented, for example, by a watercolor drawing of Queen Charlotte and the Princess Royal, a mezzotint of, uh, after a painted portrait of Mary Somerset, Duchess of Ormond, or a cut pa paper silhouette of a patrician family in their drawing room. And I'm showing you some of the works that Davies studies in um, uh, English society of the 18th century and contemporary art. Um, so obviously, contemporary art uh, is contemporary to the 18th century, not um, to Davies' own moment. For Davies and his contemporaries in 1907, modern was a property of work that was original, progressive, and forward-looking, of art that was not so much of its time as ahead of it. Contemporary, by contrast, described a neutral condition of temporal coexistence between two or more entities. While a portrait of the Duchess of Ormond or attended by an African child servant was contemporary to 18th century British society, few in 1907 would have called it modern in the sense of being progressive or forward-looking. Even here, however, the matter of what constitutes contemporary art does not remain straight, necessarily remain straightforward. The 18th century silhouette by, by Thonard, published by Davies in 1907, cannot help but look contemporary to viewers in 2012 who share a prior knowledge of the work of the living American artist, Kara Walker. I'm showing you a work by Kara Walker from 2000 on the right. In, in pieces such as Insurrection, our tools were rudimentary, yet we pressed on. Walker draws upon a history of cut paper silhouettes extending back to the late 17th century, even as she introduces bodies, gestures, and terrors never before visible in that history. For all the fierceness of Walker's reckoning with the historical past, her art can do nothing to change the social conditions and inequities that shaped 18th century society, whether British or American, whether lowercase or capital S, whether we spell society with a lowercase or capital S. But Walker can change our retrospective view of those conditions, such that, for example, the drawing room formality of the 18th century scene on the left comes to seem rigid and compulsory, a world of enforced protocols and exacting regulations to which each figure even the family dog must submit. Here's the dog. Seen through Walker's insurrection, that is, looking at the 18th century silhouette through the lens of, the contem of our contemporary work, the Kara Walker, Thonard's rendering of aristocratic privilege begins to unravel. It is as though Walker's insurgent figures may breach the boundaries of Thonard's sedate society as though the black and blue history of servants and slaves might at any moment overtake the black and white patrician family in its drawing room. Walker's art operates according to a dialectical model of history in which the past is no more settled or secure than the present. And it's this model which is very difficult to grab hold of because, precisely because it is dialectical and sees history as itself something in motion and something that is still to be reckoned with and contested. But it's this model of history um, of the present moment as still working out the past, and the past as um, being reviewed through the present that I tried to um, take on board in what was contemporary art. The temporal existence of an artwork is, now, is not bound by its moment of production or by the life or death of its creator. As it persists over time, the artwork, say in this case the Thonard, may become newly relevant to later works and social historical contexts. For the art historian Thomas Crowe, art is distinguished by its status as an expressive object, quote, 
from the past that arrives in our midst like a traveler through time, end quote. Building on this line of argument, I propose that the category of contemporary art might include not only newly produced works by living artists, but also those time travelers that arrive in our midst from earlier moments and historical context. And now, very briefly, I'm going to tell you how I do this by just sketching the chapters of the book. Um, to make this argument, each chapter in the book opens with a specific episode in the production, display, criticism, or historical study of then current art. So the first chapter is about the year 1927. In each case, I try to reconstruct the logic and retrieve the vividness of these episodes when they were contemporary, when they were now. By retrieving anachronistic moments and apparently obsolete conceptions of contemporary art, I hope to repurpose them as counterweights to early 20th, 21st century nowism. These episodes are first a course taught by Alfred Barr at Wellesley College in 1927 that is thought to have been the first college class to include then current art, architecture, theater, film, and graphic design on the syllabus. From avant-garde painting in Europe to industrial architecture and automobiles in the United States, from Russian experimental cinema, such as uh, Vertov's Man with the Movie Camera that you're seeing um, uh, referenced on by, in a uh, cover of a magazine called Sovetsko Kino or Soviet Cinema, the cover designed by St um, uh, Varvara Stepanova, who was the managing editor of the magazine. Um, that is some of the kind of work that Barr was showing his students at Wellesley in 1927 to um, current issues of magazines such as Vanity Fair and The New Yorker. Um, the course took the art and culture of its own moment as both subject matter and inspiration. And that, in a way, Barr's 1927 course at Wellesley College becomes the inspiration, uh, became the inspiration for what was contemporary art because um, of the ways in which he was making vivid the culture of the student's own moment. He actually designated all the students in the class as faculty, because he said they were all going to teach each other, as well as himself, about what was going on at that very moment. So th this first chapter examines the iconoclastic ped pedagogy and experimental sense of modernity that shaped Barr's unprecedented class. The second chapter charts a highly selective path through the curatorial program of, I'm sorry, chapter three, uh, through the curatorial program of MoMA under Barr's directorship. And it looks in particular detail at the ways in which several exhibitions of pre-modern art, including Persian frescoes, prehistoric rock pictures of Europe and Africa, which I'm showing you an installation shot from here, and Italian masters, uh, were positioned in relation to early 20th century art at the time. So what you're looking at, this is a show that was at the Museum of Modern Art, and what you're seeing are full-scale painted, well, oops, <laughs> what you were seeing, and uh, here's our, our contemporary technology intervening. Um, but in a moment, it will return, or should I do it? There we go. Um, these, are, these are works, in a sense, of contemporary art. They were made by living artists who went on expedition with um, archaeologists to, oh, throughout Africa and, and Europe. Um, and on site, they made um, drawings that, um, that were the basis for these um, watercolor renderings um, that are to the scale of the actual prehistoric uh, cave paintings. Um, so when you um, went into MoMA, you were meant to think that you were seeing, you were meant to experience the prehistoric art uh, as, 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 it, as, it exists, as it existed in prehistory, but also as a modern rediscovery of the prehistoric past. And what you were looking at was works by artists who were contemporary, even though they were unnamed as individual artists, but the copyists who made these facsimiles, contemporary to Matisse and Masson and the other artists who were on display at MoMA. Um, and then finally, the last chapter, um, considers the surprisingly bitter controversy sparked by the decision of the Institute of Modern Art, and you'll remember that in Boston, uh, who housed, among many other exhibits, the Plastics Exhibition, the decision of the Institute of Modern Art to change its name to the Institute of Contemporary Art in 1948. The change was necessary, according to the Institute, because the idea of modern art had collapsed into a narrow version of European modernism, a cult of bewilderment 
as um, its manifesto said. These are just some of the clippings of the uh, articles from the time. This caused something of a, 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 um, a public and national controversy over the renunciation of modern in favor of the contemporary. And so the last chapter looks at that um, controversy and tries to reconstruct the, symbol the symbolic and political stakes of the modern contemporary divide at mid-century. Having sketched the book's chapters, I want to conclude now by reading something from its afterword, which is called Not Now. And this is the conclusion. It takes about a year for a university press book to appear once the final manuscript has been submitted by the author. Given this, when writing what was contemporary art, I knew that it would be at least 12 months out of date by the time it was published. Rather than regretting this delay, I have come to view it as a metaphor for the necessity of falling behind the times, for the importance of losing step with the ever advancing march and marketing of contemporary art. By one recent accounting, there are now more than 100 biennial exhibitions of contemporary art across the globe, from Sao Paulo to Seoul to Sharjah, with one almost every 10 days on average. The art market has never been more genuinely global or more massively capitalized than it is today. In researching this book, I attended versions of the Venice Biennale, the Whitney Biennial, the Athens Biennial, Documenta, and Art Basel Miami, as well as various satellite events and expositions, including the 2007 Art Now Fair in Miami Beach, which I'm showing you the banners from. And by the way, those biennials that I just mentioned, uh, the ones that I went to, th that's hardly a patch on the itinerary, say, of uh, contemporary art curators uh, museum directors, collectors who go to many, many more of these hundred biennials um, in a year, a uh, hundred biennials a year than, than I did. It soon became clear to me that trying to keep up with the pace of the contemporary art world was a practical impossibility, not least because I lacked the financial resources to do so. Archival research, critical thinking, the crafting of book length projects, these tasks do not lend themselves to the tempo or logic of art now. In writing contemporary art history, it may therefore be necessary, paradoxically, to lag behind the time of the contemporary art world, behind the latest biennial opening, artist project, or blog posting. In 2012, that is right now, the culture of contemporary art seems to be burning more intensely than ever. But the glare of nowism, of uh, the current International Art Fair, E-Flux posting, Hot Young Artist, and Auction House record can be fairly blinding. The spectacular immediacy of the contemporary art world threatens to overwhelm our ability to think critically about the relation of the current moment to the past. All art has been contemporary, reads Maruzio Nanucci's 2010 neon sculpture at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. To make that glowing text into more than a truism, we need to recognize that all historical art was once current and that all contemporary art will soon be historical. We also need to grapple with how the art of the past informs and reconfigures the current moment. We need, that is to say, to grapple not only with the fast-moving art world of our own time, but also with the living history of once contemporary artists and artworks, with a past that should not be permitted to pass away. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm very happy. Um, we have time, I believe, for questions. And I, I always say the, Q, wait, the Q and A is my favorite part of any lecture, because it's where I learn I know what I said, but I don't know what you heard. So now I learned something about what you actually, what you heard, which are, can be two, as any professor can tell you, two very different things if you talk to your students. Yes. Um, thank you for a really interesting lecture. Sure. Um, I just wondered, um, I was thinking when you were talking about um, crowds and the kind of split between criticism and history with Catalan Rosanne um, and her uh, critical text, I was thinking back to people like Mayor Speer and 
um, Francois Henri, who were um, medieval scholars in the early 20th century, who were hugely interested in contemporary sculpture and how their interest in contemporary sculpture really influenced how then they started to think about um, medieval sculpture. And even in the way that they were presenting medieval sculpture in their, um, in their uh, publications, um, stripping them back to form and, and uh, you know, all of that, um, it really changed the direction of medieval scholarship. And I was just thinking, you know, all art history is also uh, contemporary. And the extent to which um, art, art history in as kind of we might, or as might be defined kind of more traditionally, also is impacted by the contemporary world, by contemporary theory, and by the fact that contemporary art historians are probably also looking at contemporary art. Yes, uh, that's an excellent point, and it goes straight to the heart of the um, ambition of this project, which is, is actually to say not only um, that all um, art was once contemporary, but that all art history um, is also being written in a contemporary moment, and that what's the conditions of the contemporary culture in which the in which history is being written shape um, how that history unfolds, as does the historical past that's actually being studied. So I don't want to say that it's completely um, uh, that the contemporary moment determines history, but that we have to understand the writing of history, including of art history, as a kind of dialectic between um, the object of study, the historical moment under um, scrutiny, and the moment of the, of the scholar's own um, practice. Uh, and I think that, um, and contemporary art is really useful because to do this because many, or what was contemporary art at the, at the moment the historian is writing, because although some art historians have been very anti uh, antipathetic to their own moment in contemporary art, many others, as you mentioned, have um, also actually written art criticism as they were doing, or a, as a sidelight to their art history, or uh, collected, or were friends with art, contemporary artists, or certainly were, were open to the energy, to the visual culture of, contempor of the contemporary art of their, of their times. And I think that um, it's very exciting when we think about art history through this double lens through the lens of the moment that the art history is looking at, but also the moment of the art historian's own life. Yes? I was wondering if you could say a bit about the relationship between the art market for contemporary art and the subject that you're talking about. Because yeah. you would, it's natural to think that there is a parallel between the students in your graduate seminar you know, wanting to get through the 90s as soon as possible and the sort of explosion of the contemporary art market in recent years. Yeah, I and mean, I think that that's, that's absolutely true. And um, one of the things that's happened, I mean, and why I meant part of the reason I mentioned art, the record, auction house records, and is that I think that the, the art world is bigger. I mean, the global art world. There are, there are more museums, for example, of contemporary art than there have ever been. Um, before and even the whole invention of something called the Museum of Contemporary Art after coming after or the Institute of Contemporary Art. And one of the things I didn't mention was the reason why they called themselves an Institute of Contemporary Art was because they were going to be a place for research and study and exhibition rather than of acquisition. So the idea was that if you were going to remain truly contemporary, you would never acquire works of art because as soon as you acquired works of art, those works would date you at some point and you couldn't stay up, you couldn't really be uh, fleet-footedly up to date if you were being, as it were, anchored or dragged down by these, these works um, from the past. But um, I think the, 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 the impact of there are more art magazines, there are, there are more art fairs, and there's, there's simply a culture of contemporary art that I think is much more, um, uh, it, it engages many more people. And the market is larger, so there's more um, opportunity to work um, in the contemporary art field, you know, um, sort of manning those booths at the art fairs or working in those galleries or, or going into consulting jobs or curatorial jobs or academic jobs. Um, and I, I do feel that the market has rendered contemporary art more um, palpable and uh, kind of more maybe um, 
you know, maybe s s somewhat more I immediate uh, than it might have than it was. For example, for Barr's Wellesley students, who um, the I talk about how the, the art um, shows that he that he and the students put up on campus were very were widely reviled by the Wellesley student body as what they called queer and, and incomprehensible art. Uh, so I don't think in 1927 that um, an educated young woman or man for that matter would have necessarily been expected to have uh, a knowledge or interest in contemporary art, in the contemporary art of their own moment. Whereas it seems to me today um, that part of the idea of being a educated young person is having a very is having some knowledge of the of contemporary culture and including one's own contemporary moment. I would also say that I think that it's not only in art history that things have become more contemporary, but also in cult the, the rise of a field like cultural studies, which is so much about contemporary popular culture, the um, interest in um, non-canonical or counter-canonical works, um, uh, I think so in sub or popular works, so something like the way in which in literary in English departments you might study the romance novel um, nowadays. Uh, I, th I think that we've seen like a turn toward the contemporary kind of across um, uh, the humanities. And I think that the art market, the growth the, of the art market sort of um, uh, amplifies what was already um, happening, you know, kind of within art history. That is, things becoming more current um, and then become even more publicized and maybe also more attractive once people see how vibrant the market and how global the market is. But I don't think this is something only uh, this turn toward the contemporary or this tendency toward nowism, I, I do think is related to other developments um, besides the market, to intellectual developments. And, Jeez. Yes, in the back. I mean, you were talking earlier about the avant-garde being ahead of the curve and relationship to the modern. And um, is it, you know, these days when there's a commodification of the, the now, is there a possibility for there to be an avant-garde? Do, do avant-gardes immediately get commodified when they happen? Well, I think there's an open question as to whether the contemporary art world um, still is operating according to a model of the avant-garde or what model of the avant-garde you know, it, it's operating um, with. Because um, so this notion that the artist or is going to be out front or is going to be a sort of advanced guard, um, an explorer or uh, uh, um, you know, is going to sort of bravely risk or go where where art has not gone before. Um, I'm not, that's one model of the avant-garde. I'm not sure that that obtains in the same way. Um, and certainly in terms of the historical avant-gardes, which had political and social um, ambitions, like the constructivists, for example, and their idea of moving art into life, um, and their sort of socialist uh, commitments, um, I'm not sure that there are, I mean, I'm not sure that um, most contemporary artists today are fashioning themselves as a political avant-garde um, or an avant-garde that's going to bring about social and political transformation. Um, I, I guess in another, let me put it another way. I'm not sure that commodification is seen as the enemy by many artists today. I think that we, I was trained in a, by, in a kind of um, Frankfurt School uh, modernist um, ideology that said that what art wants to do is outdistance you know, commodif cap commodification and, and it wants to trouble the status quo and it wants to um, be something other than mass culture and entertainment. I'm not sure that those, those models about art as critical of the culture or art as separable from entertainment or fashion or the so-called culture industry, I'm not sure that those are the most operable models for young, for artists that are emerging today. So I, so I think, yes, it's true that the avant-garde has always been commodified, um, but I don't know that young artists who would might fashion themselves avant-garde 
see that as a problem today. I don't know if that answers yeah, that makes sense. Um, your question. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how writing this book, um, obviously it's been a long time coming, and, and during that gestation period you worked on Niji mm -hmm. Warhol. How has thinking about contemporary art and, and its relation to art history affected your own art historical practice, and especially in relation to those exhibitions you did? Do you think of Warhol differently? Well, in both cases, Warhol, the, the 10 Portraits of Jews of the 20th Century, which was the, the series that the Warhol's Jews focused on, which is a series from 1980, that was a series that was critically reviled at the time that it, was, that it premiered. Um, uh, although very, it was very popular, it, it sold very well, but, um, but it was critically largely dismissed. And Ouija's work, especially his LA work, has all, you know, was never intended to be, un or understood as art with a capital A, and um, even those who admire Ouija's um, sort of film noir New York work often have trouble with his, his LA, his later work and the distortion, so, um, which was the work that was shown in Naked Hollywood. So one thing I guess is to say is that I'm always, I've always been drawn to what doesn't count as contemporary art. So what else exists in the culture um, that's kind of adjacent to or, or um, the underside of what's considered important art. So Warhol nowadays, you know, um, nobody has a problem with the portraits, or a very, I, I don't know that, that they would, they haven't been, they're not reviled, or they, the show wasn't when, when it was, uh, when the works were shown in 2005. But, um, but in 1980, Warhol was seen as kind of somewhat marginal to what was going on, which is hard to imagine now, given his um, posthumous uh, influence. Um, and I, I, part of the impulse behind this book was to say, if we think about, I'm mean, thinking now of, let's say, the show upstairs, the Aboriginal art show. Well, that is contemporary art. But so often, contemporary art is, is um, identified as only what a certain um, international art market or art world is, is writing about or looking at or, or uh, acquiring, you know, and we don't see, let's say, um, other kinds of art that are being produced right now or craft um, or um, art being produced outside of major cities or not in dialogue with what's happening in, in Art Forum magazine. We don't really see, grant those the quality of being fully contemporary. It's as though somehow, um, you know, um, Matthew Barney or whomever you might choose is more contemporary than um, artists who don't get written about and part or, or, or purchase or, or seen at art fairs or biennials in this, to the same extent. And part of what I wanted to do in the book was to say, look, there's always been all of these multiple art worlds, these multiple contemporaries. And if we think about contemporary art as always being as a category where art is alive alongside other works of art and, art and artists and viewers are alive in a certain moment that they share with others, that that could help us to see things as part of the history of art that haven't been granted that um, value in the past. And I'll, I'll just say one last thing about that. Um, you know, one of the real reservations that I had was, well, what does it mean to put Ouija? These are um, uh, photographs basically by a tabloid photographer, by a, by a crime photographer um, who really made his name as a photojournalist um, and then came out to LA to kind of try to become a celebrity and that didn't work out so well for him. But um, one of the issues I had was, uh, was thinking about well, what does it mean to put these works, these photographs which weren't intended to be art, in the Museum of Contemporary Art. So now to place what wasn't art in its own historical moment in conversation. And one of the things, one of the ways in which I explained that to myself was it turned out that Cindy Sherman and Ed Ruscha and Laurie Simmons and Carol Dunham were all collectors of late Ouija who lent works to the show. Um, and in, in Cindy Sherman's case, she lent a Marilyn distortion. And Ouija becomes really, or the, the dialogue between 
Sherman's work on femininity and Ouija's work on, and celebrity and Ouija's work, I thought was a really interesting one. And so that Ouija could, we could argue that he had an impact on contemporary art or that nowadays contemporary art is so involved with the culture of celebrity and photography and journalism that, um, it ha that Ouija has something to say to today's contemporary moment and in art that he didn't have to say in the late 40s or early 50s. And that's also part of what I'm trying to do in this book is to say art is not only intended for its own contemporary moment. It can be revived in a later moment and become, as it were, newly relevant, newly contemporary, which is sort of why I brought the Kara Walker and the Fernard in, is to sort of say we don't know what the future is going to hold in terms of artistic um, production. And the future is going to change how we will see the past. Um, and actually, the future will help us rediscover things, like let's say, like Ouija or like late Warhol, that we thought were not part of the history of art. Does that make sense? OK.